of course, you're going <laughs> to. You know that I believe that you have to feed uh, the what's happening on the ground. And uh, hacking's a nice word. It's kind of cool because it's subversive. And I do think we need some subversive practices of architecture, some rebellious actions, because the, uh, we're not teaching the right thing to students. We're not teaching history either. Because if you look at the history of architecture since the Renaissance, you will see that there's a there's a huge log of of urban strategies from Brunelleschi's Pachi Chapel to Alberti creating squares and public places to opening up the medieval city to creating the Renaissance uh, ideal of enlightenment. And I just think we have to go back to that idea of enlightenment. And the architect has to become more of a politician because urbanization, which is the greatest thing we can look at as a civilization, is our cities, right, are the best examples of of uh, human capacity, right? Um, we're looking at it from the wrong point of view of money making mm -hmm. and not looking at measuring qualities of cities based on, on uh, diversity and maybe uh, correct um, distribution of infrastructure. So, referring back to your question, the, since most of the developing world cities in Latin America, Africa, and, and Southeast Asia, are made up of informality, 90% poor, etc., right? And only 5% or 1% is taking in most of the wealth of the GDP of these countries and cities, right? We've got a problem because mayors and presidents should be working to equal distribution for everyone, right? And so if you look at the apartheid city post Mandela, you'll see that nothing has changed. Johannesburg or Cape Town is basically the same, urban-like. You do an overlay of mappings of 20 years and you're going to see the segregation is basically the same. The black live in the same neighborhoods, the, uh, the colored in another one, the white in another. And, um, and so what you have is these islands and ghettos, if you want. The fastest growing phenomena in today's urbanized world is islands and ghettos, islands of wealth and ghettos of poverty. So we need to break that. So the architect needs to maybe expand his role. Maybe he's a systems thinker. Maybe he's a strategic um, designer with punctual uh, things. Maybe he's a hacker into policy and stuff. Maybe he's an activist on the ground. Maybe he's got to build illegally and let the city come to him and then raise the discussion and, and actually backed always by the people on the ground. Power to the people. Lenin said it in the 60s. You've got the whole earth catalog by Stuart Brand looking at the ecology of the urban, urbanized planet. You've got so many examples. That's why I say we're not teaching history appropriately because we have lots of examples and new technologies that we can bring together. So I know where you're going. You're interested in, in participation, participatory practices in design and architecture, but you're wondering whether, whether that's possible or not, or whether that's just a consensus model that doesn't really work because no one reaches consensus or consensus is mediocre, right? But actually, I'm telling you that we have new technologies and new social medias. We have new programmers. So hacking again becomes very interesting or, or let's say, um, um, new, new technological solutions to make that participation possible. So let me give you an example. So if we had Occupy Wall Street, that was a super participatory um, example. People were able to use social media to come to Occupy, but they didn't figure out how to use the social media to govern. Right? They didn't understand how to turn it into a usable practice. So, for instance, Switzerland's very good at this. Switzerland has direct democracies in the sense that it votes on every public issue. So if more countries started to implement on your app phone in a very simple thing directed to young people, beautiful app, nice logos on issues of the state, of localities, of your neighborhoods, if you could vote on different levels directly on your iPhone, say yes or no, read the issues and participate, you have young people participating in politics and they're not participating now. So what we need is a new medium 
a new design so that we can better implement that participatory process of design, right? So architects may design the systems, may design the strategies, may design the network, may design the graphics, may design the, the kind of categorizations of these issues that have to do with urbanization, let's say. The whole, the whole idea of augmented reality for us to be able, or on um, public participatory processes, let's say, be able to read the changes we want in the city, to visualize those changes, super important. Even for Switzerland, we're doing a project now on Swiss Landschaft, on the whole Swiss connectivity of cities, because they're basically sprawling all over the landscape. So how could we figure out how to better utilize the public space, the train tracks, and all those things, and all that connectivity of cities, right? And so that would be very useful. And the other, um, now, um, the other thing would be the technologies for the actual building, for actually the, the, the actual component of the fabric of the city. I believe buildings should become much more scaffoldings, as you just said, or they should become structures or infrastructures, an open system. So you know very well that there was an idea of the open building from the 1960s and the 70s, which was buildings that could be adapted and changed over time. Habraken uh, is a Dutch uh, architect who thought about all of this. And so I think it's very intelligent. You build the intelligence of a building into the infrastructure, into the the structure itself into the collection of water, sanitation, and so And then you leave the whole building open to be changed over time because buildings are reprogrammed over time. So people could participate in those reprogrammings of buildings through augmented reality, through participatory projects, and the skin of the building would change and the walls can change over time and floors. And as you know from the Renaissance, what was the farm building of the nave turned into the nave of the church, turned into the nave of the hospital, turned into the nave of the university, which turned into the nave of the housing block. The same building was reutilized. So it's a generic structure. We've just invented a tablet, right, with a program where you go to a, a informal slum, you show them the layout of them with a Google map, which then is actually uh, uh, drawn in AutoCAD, right? And then you can start to play with them a game of where do you want a road, whose house gets moved, who's volunteering to move their house. Then you move the house outside of the, of the program in the sidebar. The house gets retrofit into a new size and to, to a new typology because it needs to be shortened, expanded, verticalized, two, three floors, whatever, to require the square meters that he had, right? And then he can put it back in and say who he wants to live next to. And at the end of the day, with a community of 68 households, 250 people, we can have community meetings and we can set up the strategic plan for the development of the community. And that's an interactive phase model tablet that is very useful. But it's an interesting thing that you touch the topic of refugees because I do have an idea for that. Um, Huber and I have been thinking intensely since 800,000 refugees have been just uh, accepted into Germany, which I thought was incredible, a thing for Merkel to do. Um, we've been thinking, so where do we house them? How do we house them? So we said parking garages. So I'll show tonight that we think that parking garages are not necessary anymore um, because you don't need cars in cities. I mean, Munich doesn't need parking garages. Leave the cars out of the city. Walk into the city. Take a tram. Take a train. Whatever. And come into the city. So these Parking drives over time will be transformed, so you can have ground floor, can have cars, but the upper levels of parking garages can become housing. And not only housing, they can become shops, they can become startup companies. So I think parking garages are the raw infrastructure to house the refugees. Contemporary. Yeah, contemporary examples of urban design, of course, um, and uh, you know that very well, is the cable car as an urban metro system, right? To connect all the hills of the poor. So cable car is an urban infrastructure of which we've participated quite a bit. Other things, I think the, the sales, for instance, these toolbox of cultural educational buildings that are being implemented all on the outskirts of Sao Paulo. Delyakov was the guy who invented these kind of kit of parts where they can be reconfigured depending on the geography 
right, of the place. Of course, that's also been implemented by um, Luyanda uh, Mapo in uh, Africa, Design Space Africa, in, um, with doing 45 schools for the government of South Africa in the Transkei, the poorest areas of the Eastern Cape, and he's been also doing a kit of parts, right? We know uh, uh, public plazas are essential public space, the regaining of public space, and, and safe cities. So, of course, Mocos and, and, uh, Mocos and Peñalosa in Bogota, turning Bogota from being a highly paranoid city into one of the safest cities of the world by reclaiming public space with clowns, with whatever, you know, with mimes. And you know the whole story of Mocos using psychology to change the perception of space. Right, um, and uh, there's many others, of course. Great, gro great metro systems being implemented in India, in Sao Paulo, in China, of course. The funny thing, China is implementing those metro systems so fast and rapidly expanding their cities so fast and their new cities that they're losing control on the quality of those new cities and those new spaces because they're just not thinking uh, that cities have to be about the pedestrian. Right? And it's all about watching each other and enter and engaging each other. So definitely um, uh, one of the most negative things on cities today is that we keep on building highways like in Mexico City, three floors of highways and, uh, and the car uh, city. Really, that's the most negative thing, car industry. And I'm glad that Audi is taking on the Urban Audi Forum, right? I just don't see them implementing anything. So is this just a branding ploy? I would do a call out to, to those guys to really start to put some of the money in implementing little practices, right? Um, in cities of the cities where they're selling so many Audis, right? And not just talk about it, enough talk. I want to see experimentation and implementation. And every city in the world should declare a zone for experimentation. Because if architects aren't getting the chance to experiment, no one's going to believe that they can do anything. Ah, what do I see happening in the urban next, right? In the next urban future um, of the world. I actually see that over time, as Ho Eric Hopsbaum said, social diversity and equal distribution of infrastructures and power back to the people will be the future of the 21st century. Over time, the great ideas that Lenin put in his songs about peace, love, integration, nunotopia, you know, he had this idea of a, of a world where there was no religion, where there was no, uh, 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 no segregation, etc., will be implemented. The dreams of the utopia, of an integrated, holistic environment of sustainability and, uh, and of, of interconnected, um, let's say, pods, of sustainability that somehow create a network of, of these new urban places, I see as a viable future. To bring cities and people back together, we need a real tripartite uh, uh, joining of university research, of corporations who are making the products right, and need the markets, and the communities on the ground, and NGOs, etc. We need to bring those three back together, and the politicians, of course, sorry, it would be four, four corners of a table. You need all four legs working together, and just like Henri Lefebvre said, it's to create the university of the city. So what you're going to see more and more is these integrated think tank groups in the future de developing policy and working together to implement real applied solutions.